This episode is sponsored by the host of Caradine's Cockney Sing Along, pianist and singer Tom Caradine. Hello and welcome to Film Pro Productivity, the podcast that helps film professionals, creative people, and let's face it, just about anyone to live a more focused, effective, and happy life. My name is Carter Ferguson, and this is episode 49. Don't be offended, it's outrage porn. In the last episode, I looked at affirmations and how they can be used to change your life. And this isn't some hippy-dippy placebo for making you feel better. They really can be brought to bear and make a difference to your life and work. If you haven't checked it out, then please go and have a listen. This has been a long season for me and I've been reworking it a lot as I go and today's topic is actually one of several that I nearly had to drop to make other things fit in. It's something that's been increasingly on my mind but as with many of my shows it's not something I hear getting discussed all that often and I should say that it did actually migrate into season four for a while but it's been reinstated as the episode that I'd planned to do here anyway. Um, it was briefly for a time about delegating but I decided I was going to have to run a few tests on that topic before I tackle it. For example, I'll try using a virtual assistant, that's an online assistant, for a time and I'll see how it goes. I just need to get it very clear in my head what I'll actually be asking them for help with. And I'll report back on whether that's a good or a bad experience and talk about it in a later episode which will be called Delegating or The Art of Delegating or something exciting like that. But if you have any experience of successful or I suppose even unsuccessful delegating then I'd genuinely love to hear from you. You can get in touch via the contact page on the website Film Pro Productivity. There's two options for getting in touch. You can fill in a, a form which is like an email form and the other option, if you've got a mic, so you can do it through your phone or you can do it through a computer if it's got a microphone on it, is to leave a speak pipe message, which is effectively a voicemail, an online voicemail service. And I think I said before it was 45 seconds you get, but I, I think it's now, um, I don't know if it changes or if I just got it wrong. I think it's a minute and a half you have to leave a message. So please do use that. Uh, I would really like to get some opinions on delegating. It's not something I'm particularly great at, although I do it quite a lot. I think I can do better in my life and be more productive if I can learn the art of delegation and, well, we'll see how that goes. I'll report back in a later show. But today's show, which is called, <laughs> I've forgotten already, uh, Outrage Porn, is simply a heads up about something which I have come to believe is sapping away our limited supply of mental energy in these strange times. I decided to raise it here as a sort of public warning as it could be wearing away at your ability to be productive without you even knowing it. As I've done my research for this show, I've become more and more certain that it's something we should be very wary of and learn to shut out. And if we can intelligently acknowledge it and recognise it, then we will be able to protect ourselves from it. According to Wiktionary.com, the term outrage porn was coined by New York Times writer Tim Creeder to emphasise the way the media deliberately provoke feelings of righteous indignation in us by pandering to people's self-indulgent desire to feel outraged. It occurs in almost every form of media, but is perhaps more often seen in 24-hour news programmes newspapers, remember them, and the internet. We are dominated by a relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. Edward Bernays, unquote. Outrage porn comes about when the media ensures that a statement or report is released which is deliberately skewed in a way to make the reader or viewer or listener etc. so furious about a topic that there will be a public outcry. That same media then reports on the outcry which it has carefully set up and so creates a perpetual news cycle of outrage over 
in most cases, nothing at all. In episode one of this show, I talk about finding and honing a higher level of thinking. It's described elsewhere in productivity circles as intelligent thought or intelligent achievement. Napoleon Hill describes it in The Law of Success as accurate thought. And it's there that Hill urges us to question the facts that we hear and separate those proven facts from mere information. He asks us to separate facts into two classes, the important and the unimportant, or the relevant and the irrelevant. All facts which will aid us in any extent whatsoever in the attainment of our definite chief aims and goals in life are regarded as important and relevant. All that you can't use are regarded as unimportant and irrelevant. If you haven't yet listened to episodes 40 through 45, which cover Hill's amazing book, The Law of Success and 16 Lessons, then you really are doing yourself a disservice. In the book, Hill also says that if someone presents a fact, in inverted commas, to you, you would do well to ask them, how do you know this before accepting it as truth? We don't get this opportunity, though, when bombarded by outrageous stories in the press. It's a world of ever-increasing falsity that we are living in. Beware, Carter Ferguson, unquote. Actually, I'm only joking. Try this one on for size, though. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organised habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. Edward Bernays, unquote. And by the by, Edward Lewis Bernays was an Austrian-American pioneer in the field of public relations and propagandas, and he is referred to in his obituary as the father of public relations. So, so this is someone who knows what they are talking about. He died in 1995. He was born in 1891. I'm just reading that straight off the interweb. Could all be wrong. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. Anyway, where was I? Actually, while I'm on this aside, do you know what you find when you look up quotes on manipulation of the masses on Google? You find quotes from Hitler. And I kid you not, he talked an awful lot about manipulating the masses. The greater the lie, he said, the greater the chance that it will be believed. He's the guy that said that. And he also said, if you wish the sympathy of the broad masses, you must tell them the crudest and most stupid things. And tell a lie loud enough and long enough, and people will believe it. You want a good reason why you should be worried about outrage porn and being manipulated? Look to Adolf Hitler. He's the reason we should be worried about this sort of manipulation we're facing at the moment. He was talking about it openly, telling people what he was doing, and he still got to power. Crazy. So we're bombarded with these news stories designed to manipulate in us this all-too-familiar emotion outrage. And the mainstream and lesser-known media outlets are all taking full advantage of it. If we aren't careful we may allow outrage culture to change our society so drastically that we embrace tribalism and choose to interact only with people who are exactly like ourselves. Jeff Charles, unquote. The Urban Dictionary describes outrage culture, as opposed to outrage porn, as follows. When people play the victim card and bend over backwards to be as offended as possible when they really aren't, using hissy fits, political correctness, character assassination, and a false sense of moral authority, the outrager hopes to gain power and public recognition for their brave act of justice, as well as a sense of control over their meaningless existence. Now, I had actually recorded a section in here that gave a specific example of this behaviour in an individual who's publicly known, but I've cut it not for fear of legal action, but because I am frightened of a deliberate misinterpretation of my words. And that's, of course, the aim of some people who use outrage culture to manipulate us. 
to use fear of public retaliation to silence perceived opponents. And I really tried to script a neutral comment on the matter, but no matter what way I came at it, I saw trouble. What I realised is that some people who have perhaps become activists for social issues due to their profile as actors or influencers or whatever are actually building careers out of all of this. They deliberately start using outrage to raise their profile and sometimes just to get attention. I'm really trying not to make this episode become what it is trying to warn against, but on this particular point though, let me say that there are some individuals who will deliberately misuse outrage to serve their own personal and promotional agendas. Their actions though, as their behaviours are questioned more and more, even by their peers and supporters, weaken, I believe, the true causes that they are supposedly fighting for. On that note, in fact, let's not forget here that many who push bizarre social agendas are very possibly just trolls who don't really believe the stuff that they are putting out, especially if it is anonymous. And an example I saw just last week was someone tweeting about and getting a lot of angry replies too about how they will be taking their pet, their dog, to the vet because they believe that their dog is trans. And it was, yes, you heard me right, they believe that their dog was trans. That's their deliberate setup, that they are throwing out the fishing line to see who they can catch. And it was clearly a wind-up that certainly worked. A lot of the stories that appear are just wind-ups and attention seekings and fishing expeditions, but they are damaging the, what we're trying to say, they have a damaging effect in that they can belittle and misrepresent the real voices and the real problems of the world. Uh, journalist and broadcaster Jeff Charles, who I'm not sure if he's right wing or not. I tried to look, I tried to find out a little bit about him, but he seemed to write a very neutral article to me. So I've got a couple of quotes from him here. <laughs> I always like to double check the background of people I use quotes from in case they turn out to be the head of the Ku Klux Klan or something like that. But I believe he's just a broadcaster, so I should be all right. But he writes that outrage culture is marked by a tendency for people to become overly offended at the slightest occurrence. It could be an offhand remark about race that someone assumes to be a microaggression, perhaps a talk show host made critical comments about the president, and in some instances it could be a politician failing to comment on a particular situation in the way you believe they should, or quite often in the way the interviewer believes they should. He goes on to state when talking about the USA that unfortunately, as a nation, we have become addicted to outrage porn. The article I took that from was published in June 2018 and it references three major stories that resulted in a tremendous level of internet outrage. Firstly, actress and comedian Roseanne Barr posted a racist tweet about Obama advisor Valerie Jarrett. Then talk show host Samantha B gave a profanity-laced rant against Ivanka Trump implying that she has incestuous relations with her father, and not to be undone, more offensive blog posts written by MSNBC host Joy Reid surfaced. And once you become, you start to become anyway, aware of this stuff, as I'm sure many of you out there already are, you start to see these stories everywhere. One that I saw causing absolute chaos and offence everywhere this year was the seemingly racist tweet by British comedian and radio host Danny Baker, who posted an old black and white picture of a man and a woman with a chimpanzee with the unfortunate caption for him, Royal Baby Leaves Hospital. And next thing you know, him and Meghan Markle got dragged into, a, as far as I'm concerned, a completely manipulated racism row. The thing is, I didn't know anything about Meghan Markle's heritage either. I just don't follow this whole royal thing. It's not, it's not of interest to me. So when I saw what he'd tweeted after the fact, I should say, I saw a vaguely amusing 
gag about class, I would read it as. But because it's not in my wavelength to think in racist terms, I, I just wasn't brought up that way. The perceived racism in it just would never have occurred to me. So it, what worries me there is that I could easily have fallen into the same trap that he did. And not with Meghan Markle, probably, or in that particular scenario, but I, I might have said something uh, in, incorrect or whatever that that could have been misinterpreted by someone, and that worries me. So I became somewhat fascinated as this whole thing was unfolding, and what I realised right away was that the media were deliberately pushing forward and quoting from the negative tweets that were appearing, and they were stirring a proverbial hornet's nest of trouble that resulted in Danny Baker ham-fistedly apologising, which was just weird, and then <laughs> getting fired from his job. I looked at the Twitter accounts, though, of those that had been chosen by the press to represent the initial outrage, and they came from virtually new accounts with virtually no followers. I mean, they, this was just as it was kicking off, maybe in the first 20 minutes or so. Many of these initial posts were from, in effect, as far as I could see, troll accounts. Some people say troll. I don't know when we started calling it troll, but troll accounts is what I'd say, with a political agenda, winding the whole thing up. Then, of course, came the backlash of genuine hatred for the guy from people and organisations who were, in the end, comparing him, this comedian, to Hitler, which is very rich coming from them, given those quotes from Hitler I just gave you a minute or so ago. But my point is that whether you believe Danny Baker decided to deliberately, after 40 years in the business, suddenly reveal himself to be a closet racist via a random tweet on Twitter, he isn't, by the way, or not, that the media, and possibly something beyond the media if it were to get quite dark about all of this, deliberately chose to lift only the tweets where people were most outraged and report on them. And the press kept this fakery going on for about three weeks in the end and constantly fanned the flames of a, what I regard as a non-story at the cost of a man's livelihood and Meghan Markle's privacy because the frenzy of outrage they'd created was so strong. A lot of it seemed to come from the States where, where the royal family are possibly loved more than they are here. Um, and of course, there was a racism element to it as well. So it just it seemed to hit the really, really good precise markers for causing outrage in people. But anyway, the cost was far greater than just that man's job and, and Meghan Markle getting caught up in something which she probably would rather had just blown over. It was bigger than that, though, as many people all over the world expended energy on the matter. They got riled up attacking or defending him, and that in turn created a kind of mini race hate war for no good reason whatsoever. It was an expenditure of energy and effort that should have and could have been spent on more positive and productive matters. That's my point here today. If we allow ourselves to be drawn into this shit, we are allowing ourselves to be manipulated on quite a major level. In each of the stories that I mentioned before, the offender apologised for their actions, but people's decisions on whether or not to forgive them following this whole thing seem to be based primarily on their political leanings from what I'm reading. Right-leaning individuals are more likely to forgive Roseanne Barr, who is an outspoken Trump supporter, while people on the left accused her of being racist. And the same can kind of be said about the Danny Baker story. These types of occurrences are nothing new though, and the media is all too happy to use them to divide us further. The basic tool for the manipulation of reality is the manipulation of words. If you can control the meaning of words, you can control the people who must use those words. Philip K. Dick, unquote. It's my belief that this is something which has probably always existed to some extent, but has been magnified by the World Wide Web and the invention of 24-hour news. It may even be thanks to them, though, that we, the masses, which Hitler was talking about, have started to notice the manipulation. I can go to Twitter right now and pick out a manipulative story almost at a glance. 
And the one that popped out today was that a TV network has banned the use of the word uppity after a single complaint. That's outrageous, isn't it? Unsurprisingly, this is a Meghan Markle related story as she is used, it seems to me, as a pawn in these outrage stories at every opportunity by the UK press. And it took me 10 seconds to find that example and if I look tomorrow or later today even, if all goes as planned for the press, I will find a bunch of stories about half the people in the world and how they are outraged by the banning of this word and how the other half are not as it was, and I'll push the boat out here on this one, as it was racist. <laughs> Which is a favourite, a particularly tasty favourite of the Outragers. And another tasty piece of Outrage bait that I can see, I was actually sent this because I've been talking about it on Twitter and I think some people might be looking forward to this episode. Hopefully it's going to be good for you. But there's a story about a studio exec um a studio exec in a film company who wanted to cast Julia Roberts in 1994, by the way. this Yeah, we need to get outraged about historical things that have happened as well, remember. But he wanted to cast Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman. Now, thanks to Wikipedia in 2019, I can tell you that Harriet Tubman was a black American abolitionist that died in 1913. I doubt if this story is true at all, though, that the... And, and the, the thing is, this article presents zero proof that this uh, story is true. But I doubt that some probably white movie executive in 1994 would have known who Harriet Tubman was. I doubt, I've got to say, that many a uh, black exec would know who she was as well, perhaps, at that time. His suggestion is easy to get riled up about, though, as if you are looking for wrong in the world, you are going to find it. But in reality, maybe it was just a stupid thing that he said in that meeting. And surely we've all done that in our time. That he or she, I challenge you, <laughs> that he or she that has never made a mistake in their life throw the first stone at that guy. But you better get a time machine to do it as he's probably dead already. And even if he isn't, does saying that really make him a racist? Do we really need to get riled up about something somebody possibly said in 1994? This was news stories again and again and again. Outrage porn, absolutely disgraceful. And the word racism is slopped about like a wet fish in the world of outrage. Another story uh, out today, which has been passed on to me by several people, is that a USA Today reporter, Tom Nichols, was accused of being a racist as he said he didn't like Indian food. That certainly seems to be what I'm picking up from the way it's getting reported. But don't worry for him, though, as he can report on this tomorrow on how he laughed at the outrageousness of it all and he can benefit from this continuous news cycle from getting caught up in it. So I'm not too worried about uh, Tom Nichols. He'll, I'm sure, get an article out of it. By the way, the word ban has become an outrage-inciting word in itself. Everything's banned these days, if you believe the press, and we must be outraged by it. I could probably come up with a list of ten words right now off the bat that uh, would be used to invoke outrage. In fact, let's see if I'll, I'll have a go. Racist is a good place to start, but let's try SJWs. Trump, good bet on Trump. Safe space, privilege... Brexit is a gold mine of outrage here in the UK. Any number of religious or political references, virtue signalling, that's a good one. And I'll let I'll end I don't know if that's ten, but it's quite a lot. I'll end with Star Wars, as I had to sit through The Last Jedi and I was certainly offended by that one. I'll leave you to think of more, but the internet will always provide if you draw a blank on that. One thing worth mentioning is that outrage culture prevents us from engaging in the exchange of ideas. Discussions seem to have become nothing more than contests to see which side has more of a reason to get offended. Interviews on TV with politicians are now kind of witch hunts to get them to admit some greater moral wrong or outright lie, which they, of course, are going to deny anyway. I'm trying to be kind of politically neutral with this one. I'm trying to be... I'm trying to use accuracy of thought, as Napoleon Hill would say. I'm hoping it is coming across in that way. I'm not really telling these stories 
so you'll get outraged by them. I'm kind of telling you these stories and giving these examples just so that you're more aware of them and they're easier to spot. And I'm well aware that by merely tackling this topic, I'm going to get it in the neck from somebody, as the offence reaction gene is so ingrained in some of us that they go out of their way to be outraged. I mentioned this in the bullying episode as it become, for some, a form of bullying. And I kind of deliberately used the term snowflake there as well, as I knew for those people who do virtue signal their way through life on a crusade fueled by kind of hate, that they wouldn't like it. Yes, I, I am kind of bad that way sometimes, I do admit it. I feel I'm at risk of rambling here, but I need to wind up this episode anyway. I, I, I want to say that I believe that some of us, the aware of the world, those that listen to this podcast, for example, can break our addiction to outrage culture by refusing to be influenced by outrage porn and choosing not to be offended by every story that the media forces upon us. I can kind of see that most people are not offended by things and most people do look past it, but I think there is a risk of getting drawn into stuff, even though we are aware of it. True, unadulterated outrage does have a place in this world. Without it, oppression would never have been resisted and slavery would never have been abolished. But this fake outrage thing, this adopted human need to get a fix of outrage, never to be let go of, must be put to death. And to do that, it must be, in my opinion, ignored. Not silenced, though, as if you push back, it will just cause more outrage and continue the cycle. Ignoring it, for me, though, is a solution. And, and when I say ignoring it, I don't mean ignore that it's happening. Be very aware that it's happening. But if it starts to happen to you, if someone picks an argument with you online, for example, if you find yourself getting drawn into or replying to a post online or a news article that is clearly designed to get you wound up, then walk away from it. Remove yourself from that situation. Because we're never going to make a positive impact on our lives, on our careers, or on history by getting mad at some f***ing celebrity for making a comment we disagree with or that pricks our delicate opinions. Only by not responding to these things, not retweeting them, not liking or sharing, not engaging in any way, not raging about them and not getting outraged by the outrage, which is another thing you can get caught up in, are we going to neutralise this toxic fad known as outrage porn? I didn't realise all of this stuff that I'm talking about when I started this episode. I, I, I realised it as I got into it. My, my, my initial point um, was really just to say... Don't get caught up in this because your energies should be used elsewhere. And I never knew until I did my research that it would open up such an Aladdin's cave of toxicity that I think I could extend it into future episodes in some way, but which I will leave for now. I, I don't want to become that which I preach about. <laughs> I'm trying not to preach too much anyway. We are clearly being manipulated though, but we can choose to say no and ignore it. If you've ever been riled up by a pointless celebrity news story or by some outrageous suggestion within it or an internet argument with someone who will say white when you say black just for the fun of winding you up or in tit-for-tat chatter over a point of little or no practical value, meaning or relevance on social media, then you will already have experienced what we now know as outrage culture. When we exchange these fiery back and forth to try and defend our points, and even if we don't respond at all but walk away angry or frustrated or unhappy about that discussion, we still find ourselves affected by it. Next time that you sense that you're getting riled by a troll or an aggravating virtue signaler, they're, they're a problem, by the way, as the slippery slide between the lines trying to be your friend but subtly undermine your arguments and will never allow you to get the last word in on discussions, Janet Hill, unquote, then just identify the source and utilise the block function on whatever site that you are on, block and mute and just walking away are surefire solutions 
to silencing the problem of outrage culture. Just because you're offended doesn't mean you're right. Ricky Gervais, unquote. Your call to action this week is to work on improving your outrage antenna. Instead of allowing yourself to get pulled in and wasting your time and energy getting riled up about whatever the latest outrage porn manipulation is, shut it out, block it out if you have to, and work instead on improving your own life. Keep control of your emotions and live a happier, healthier, less stressful life away from the manipulations of the press and the trolls. This is all just an extension of what I call the bullshit antenna, which I must do an episode on. That's needed these days, I'm sure you know, to separate news stories from sponsored content, sometimes known as lies, to separate genuine product reviews from paid reviews, or as I like to call them, lies, and to separate the ads from the news story, which is possibly lies anyway, incidentally, that you're trying to read beneath the We Value Your Privacy pop-up, which I call the Do They Fuck. I'll post a recent screenshot I took from The Independent as an example of what I'm talking about here. So, that's the end of today's episode, though. I hope that you found it interesting, and if I have offended you at any point in all of this, then do a self-assessment to double-check if you really are offended or if you're just automatically responding in this way to get a dopamine kick. I don't want to give Hitler any more oxygen today, but I did eventually find a quote of his that I agreed with earlier on. He said that a politician should never allow themselves to be photographed in a bathing suit, which, Hitler or not, is a fair point. I'm sure this is going to offend someone. I feel like Ricky Gervais saying this. It is a good point, though. You you want to see how big a, nut, a nutcase Hitler was? Search for quotes for Hitler. I, honestly, I had to get to page 13 of his quotes to find that one. And everyone before that was just mental. Anyway, it's time to quit being offended, though. So I'll end with a quote from Dolly Parton, who said, I'm not offended by all the dumb jokes because I know that I'm not dumb. And I also know that I'm not blonde. And I thought I was finished there, but let me just add one thing. My friend Jim said, if you're researching this topic of outrage culture, you must watch season 19 of South Park. He then followed it up by saying you must watch season 20 of South Park. I have started watching these. I'm not a big South Park fan, but wow, 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 wow. You've got to watch it. If you If this is a topic that interests you, season 19, it's free on Amazon Prime, if you have Amazon Prime. Get watching it. Very, very funny and covers this topic and far, far more. If you want to be aware of perhaps how we're getting manipulated or aware of how uh, far off the rails um, society is going, that is a really great snapshot of some of the stuff that's going wrong. So season 19 South Park. Anyway, next week I will be, just before Christmas too, launching the 50th episode. Yes, you heard me. The 50th episode of this show. And the topic will be imposter syndrome. For now though, folks, take control of your own destiny. Don't believe everything you read on the internet or get worked up about it either. Keep on shooting and join me next time on Film Pro Productivity. The music that you can hear right now is Adventures by Ihumitsu. You can view the show notes for this episode on the official website filmproproductivity.com. You can follow my personal accounts on Twitter and Instagram at fight underscore director, or you can follow the show on Twitter, where is there is the most activity is on Twitter at Film Pro Prod Pod, or on Facebook at Film Pro Productivity, where there is next to no activity despite my best efforts. Please feel free to join me there and ask questions or make suggestions. Please support the show by subscribing, spreading the word about it, and leaving me. Please, please leave an awesome review. Thank you.